We go back to the campaign with a guy who is pretty pivotal in it tonight. But we also go forward because I'm sure Ken Block would like to talk about the things he's working on going forward. You remember Ken Block, he ran for governor on the Republican side his second time. Fell about 10 points short in the Republican primary. It was a long road for him, but he's uh, true to his citizen form. He's been out speaking about things he thinks are important, including Roadmap RI, that thing that everyone is starting to go, what the heck is that? Uh, and nobody knows, and a whole bunch of other initiatives. So I'm enjoying the opportunity to have Ken back on the program uh, tonight. Welcome in to my state of mind. I am Dan York on this Monday evening. We've got a lot going on. Funky weather out there, huh? Rain miserable today, but... At least it felt balmy. It's so balmy that it's warm in here. You know, the air conditioning's all ready for 20 degree, 25, 35 degree weather, and it's been 60 outside. Ugh. So anyway, um, it's a little hot in the kitchen, but we shall survive. Let's find out what's going on this evening. Uh, just wondering, probably not, but keep it in mind. This is a tempest in a teapot, and I'll talk about the timing here in just a second. This was a, a little phrase uttered by our governor-elect that made me say, no, 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 a lot of bit, not just a little bit. Well, it's big ball season, you know, ball, basketball. I forgot to write the B and just says, I think that looks funny. So we kept it up there. But that's kind of like vernacular. You want to play some ball? We're playing some ball here in Rhode Island this weekend, no doubt. And they're playing some different kind of ball, you know, the other side. They're unstoppable, and your state of mind is always something that I'm interested in. Um, and I am interested, so we will see what you have to say this evening. Uh, let's dig in, check in to the entire list. Yeah, I thought, I don't know, maybe. Here's the headline. Chuck Hagel says, I'm all done. It's funny, you would never would think there was any pressure based on the ceremony they had at the White House, both the vice president and the vice president. I say the vice president twice. The vice president and the president are flanking Chuck Hagel as he makes a very diplomatic presentation, and the president makes a very diplomatic presentation. But as CBS reports, there's a lot of undercurrent. Sources say the White House hasn't been happy that Hagel wasn't a more vocal supporter of the president's policies. And Pentagon sources tell CBS News Hagel was fed up with micromanaging from the White House. Secretary Hagel was the only Republican in President Obama's cabinet. The former Nebraska senator also fought in the Vietnam War and received two Purple Hearts. President Obama did not announce a replacement today. Hagel plans to serve until one is confirmed. And of course, one of the guys that's always in the mix is Jack Reed, our senior senator. He says no. So I was thinking, Jack for Chuck? No. Uh, Ted Nisi's got a nice piece at WPRI.com worth reading about this. And Ted uh, echoes a lot of what I was saying this afternoon, which is, why would he want to? You never know. He might wake up one morning and say, I want to. And if he does, this president will put him right in the mix. I mean, he was named as the you know second or third you know, in a group of two or three or top five, every media outlet in the country has got Jack Reed in there. You know, Jack's an interesting character. He couldn't get unelected in the state if he robbed a bank. That's how secure he is. Was just reelected and has now six comfortable years in front of him. He's very popular on the national media scene. He gives little attention to the local media scene because he doesn't want to make any missteps that would cost him electability here in the state. He has become the corporate senator du jour. I think he does a pretty good job, if you believe in some of his left politics. Uh, I just wish he was more accountable here at home. Anyway, uh, Jack probably will sit this invitation to be a player in the DOD secretary job out, but you never know. Most likely not. Next item. Yeah, okay, so little secret, don't tell anybody. We're not live, we're Memorex. We record this program in the late afternoon. And wouldn't you know it, the grand jury reports out that they have a decision on an indictment about an hour prior to our production schedule. And so you may already now know what happened there. You may not, my guess is you may. And here's what the whole uh, pretension felt like. Metal and water-filled barricades are in place outside the courthouse in Clayton, Missouri. 
A grand jury is expected to meet here again today to decide if Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson should be charged in the shooting death of unarmed teen Michael Brown. Dozens of protesters held a peaceful demonstration near St. Louis last night. There were no arrests. Officials hope protesters will remain calm after the grand jury's decision is announced. Missouri Governor Jay Nixon declared a state of emergency last week. The move has been criticized for adding to the tension as the grand jury meets. Which, you know, we had headlines all afternoon that looked like this, time.com and more, and there's a lot of bracing. Uh, as we speak, we just learned from WBZ in Boston uh, that the grand jury indictment announcement might come down around 8 o'clock. So it might actually happen after our show tonight. Anyway, we'll certainly be able to comment on it at the radio tomorrow at noon till 3 and take your telephone calls on WPRO, and we'll talk about it here tomorrow night as well. My only thought is the pressure to be a member of that grand jury must be significant. Remember, this is not a conviction decision. This isn't an indictment decision. An indictment is a charge. But even that is high charged. Yes, as we move along here a little bit, uh, I watch newsmakers like I always do. Tim White, Ted Nisi record that very popular weekend show produced by Eyewitness News. And Gina Romano, our governor-elect, appeared for the first time for a long-form conversation and I must tell you, um, while I am impressed by the treasurer, always have been, uh, you know, overall, she's become a little bit, um, well, let me run this and maybe you can share with me a thought if you haven't seen the show already. Interesting question about where she stands for the church after that big, big to-do that probably cost her a handful of points during the general election. You know, when she said the church goes their way and I go mine on abortion issue. Bishop Thomas Tobin said in the diocesan newspaper, the Rhode Island Catholic, that he had a nice exchange with you. Um, what kind of exchange? Did, did yeah. you talk to him? Yes, we had a meeting. Uh, I, I went to his home uh, with my husband, and we had a terrific meeting, and I look forward to working with him. Do you feel like you need to mend the fence there with him after that campaign? Uh, a little bit, you know, I think so. I, it was important to me that I convey to him that I have a deep respect for him and also I love the church. I've been Catholic my whole life and I, it was important for me that he knows that. Oh, isn't that nice? A little bit, huh? How about a lot of it? How about in a very uh, dominant Catholic community, a lot of it? Because if you owe him a little bit, you owe us a little bit. I think you owe us a lot of it, uh, Gina. I'm not suggesting you have to abdicate your position on the life issue, but uh, that lack of delicateness during the campaign about handling it and positioning yourself as a practicing Catholic and more or less telling the church to fly a kite, which was the perspective when you said the church believes one thing and I work on another, uh, I think that deserves a lot of bit of nurturing. But maybe that's just me. Next item. Big, big weekend. Are you kidding me? Headlines from Connecticut and the Mohegan Sun and the Hall of Fame Classic down there. This was the second of two games back to back where PC won. You see some last minute good stuff there from the Friars. They blew Florida State out of the building on Saturday and then they come back on Sunday and beat Notre Dame who had not yet lost, I believe, by one. 75-74, so the Friars are 5-0, and and now they're going to get some great national attention, and they're going to be, they're getting better and better and better, so that's great, and then you go down to Kingston, and you see that for the first time since 1998, Rhode Island beat a top 25 team at home with what was a great win, overtime, most exciting college atmosphere I have seen in a long time, and by the way, a sold-out Ryan Center, there's no better college atmosphere, all due respect to PC and the dunk, this place is louder and crazier and nuttier. And when all those kids show up, it's a heck of a thing. And they stormed the floor. It wasn't a national championship. They're only 3-0. But beating a team like that, pretty profound. We have a December 10th battle between URI and PC happening at the dunk this coming couple of weeks. And boy, is that going to be a dandy. It's so great. Then you add in Brian, you add in Brown, and some great hockey. It's going to be a great sports collegiate winter around here. And those two teams might just go to the dance, the both of them. It's early. One team we know that's going to its dance are these guys. Are you kidding me? 
No, really. I mean, it, 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 sometimes it just feels like it's unfair. When the Patriots get on a roll, it's just, it's just you know, look, they're just unbelievable. We have a headline on that. Yeah, I think so. I don't think they're going to lose. I don't think they're going to lose again. I think you got a Super Bowl coming. When I say you, I mean you because I'm not one of you. I mean, I'm one of you, but I'm not one of you. I've been around here a long time, but I'm one of these guys. Go to the other one, will you, Kev? The, yep. the other one? Yep. Yeah. All right, so we get one terrific receiver who can catch a ball with one hand. Okay. It was a great catch. But the kind of ridiculousness that's going on about this thing, it's a great catch. It's one hand, it's a great catch. But it's not the greatest catch you've ever seen. Did it win anything? No. The Giants got beat last night. Now, David Tyree, that was a great catch. Your state of mind. All you got to do is give me a ring. That last commentary, by the way, was for Kevin. Thought maybe he'd throw something from behind the screen. He sits up there in section three, whatever, watching a real football team while I just try to carve out a little satisfaction. Anyway, you can email me. You can Facebook post. And here's the here's the Facebook. Uh, oh, that's an email. Uh, as Obama is ordering five million illegals to get green cards, he's cutting benefits for veterans. One question that needs to be answered: How do we know it'll only be five million? What green cards or illegals? Uh, we don't know there'll only be five million. That's why this is a fluid situation, no doubt. Stay tuned. There will be quite the response by Congress, one way or the other. Just remember, as I've said, we're not busting anybody back. We're not. Ken Block, next. I'm interested in my guest's take on this and a whole bunch of other things. You know, I'm not big on disposing great minds, even though they may not have won the election. And one of the great things about Ken Block, I think, is that even after you uh, lost the, the first time, though secured your 5% for the moderate party, seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Lifetime. You stayed very engaged, which caused you to stay even more engaged and run again. Welcome back. Nice to have you. Nice to be here. You know, you know only, only candidates who've not one decide to grow a little mustache and a beard. And all that kind of <laughs> it's kind of like you're, ah, I'm you know, free again. I had to shave thing, every right? day for about a year and a half, and <laughs> I just wanted to be able to not shave for a while. Then, like being the boss of your own company, you can do whatever the heck you want. I can do want. pretty much whatever my wife will let me do. You keep her, how is she doing? She wasn't that happy that you ran the second time. She I know. Was, she's very happy, and the kids are happy to have me home having dinner. And uh, being the dad taxi on the weekend, so, so it's, it's, back, work, it's working out. Back to a normal life? Back to a very normal life. I want to talk about that a little bit. I just threw that roadmap, roadmap, roadmap RI thing up because I think it's one of the more interesting uh, undercurrent but going to be pretty profound conversations. And you've had a lot to think about in terms of economy. You were trying to drive the conversation on economy. Um, what do you think about this? plan, this economic development plan that's turned into kind of a social equity plan, it seems right now. So for me, that really came out of left field. Roadmap Rhode Island wasn't in the dialogue during the campaign. Right. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't it, talked they about. It, it, was un it was really behind the scenes. And then after the primary and after the general election, all of a sudden, there it is. Uh, I actually really hadn't heard much about it. And then I went to the website and tried to read some of that hundred and whatever pages. And I couldn't do it. It was just marketing gobbledygook. Uh, there is no economic development plan buried in that whole thing. And when it's spooked and sold as a economic development plan, but it doesn't do anything to improve what Rhode Island is and how we do things economically, what is it? Mm -hmm. I, 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 to me, it's a, it seems to be a gigantic waste of time. What do you think is going to be a pivotal discussion, the likes of which will get you engaged in the public dialogue in 2015? The biggest challenge we face collectively in this state is more than a billion dollars in deficits over the next four years. The deficit this year is almost $200 million. The year after that, it's 250. The year after that, it's 350. And the year after that, it's over $400 million. And when we close the 200, that doesn't mean 200 is gone out of the 250. It means we have to then go find 250 the next year. It is a huge issue. That's $1,000 for every man, woman, and child living in the state. 
how are we going to do that? What are we going to do? How do we keep services going? Uh, for me, I think the, uh, what I was talking about is the only way to do it. We have to cut the waste out of the budget and we have to get our budget deficits, structural budget deficits under control. It really is the biggest thing that we have. Think about this. And this is what I did for Operation Clean Government. I keynoted their annual meeting this past week. We owe about $9,000 UI and everyone living under our, our roofs uh, to settle up the budget deficits, 38 studios, stop the bridges from falling down, the unfunded pension liabilities. That's state level debt. About $9,000 roughly. If you live in Providence, you owe more than that to settle provinces de Providence's debt. More than $10,000 for every person living in Providence, whether you're two months old or 200 years old, you owe over $10,000 plus the state's $9,000. This is a crisis. This is what keeps businesses from coming to Providence, and this is the issue of the day. Yeah, no but question mo about most it. elected officials think it's mortgageable. It is. This is not mortgageable. In fact. Providence's debt may not be solvable unless you go to bankruptcy. I don't know how you deal with that much unfunded liability given the challenges that they have. Oh, Dan, Her Dan Harrop, the Republican who made himself look like a knucklehead at the end of the election with the way he comported himself, tried to bring that message on a credible level. And I thought he was a good third voice in that mayor's race until he started to act like a circus you know, routine. Um, but the new mayor is going to have to confront that. There's no question. I uh, wonder if the state will pressure the city to take a look at that. They, they're going, they have to take a look at it because as a business owner, why would I want to go into Providence and own some chunk of that debt that you had no business in creating in the first place? It's a big challenge. It's a huge, huge, huge challenge. The issue of the next four years, there's no question. It's, it's going to define Gina Raimondo's uh, administration, I'm sure of it. All right. Well, I'm sure you'd have a tidbit or two for her. We'll talk about that dynamic when we come back. Stay with me. So what's a guy like you do on the sidelines here now? I mean, to your credit, after your first run, you came back and kept working on the master lever, giving due deference to Operation Clean Government that did a good job on that. And so come 2016, we won't have to deal with the master lever anymore. Right. So uh, thanks for your good work on that. Um, you're passionate about how much trouble we are in financially. Do you ask for a seat? Does, it, does someone like Gina Raimondo say, hey, listen, this guy didn't even make the cut in the Republican primary, but he's pretty smart. Let me go pick up the phone. Certainly you'd take the call, right? I, I mean, would take the call from any governor who called me looking for advice and or help. Do you, do you unsolicitedly offer it? Do you, do you wedge your way into the conversation for the better of the quality of life of Rhode Island? You just sit there, watch your business grow, and watch the, you know what, hit the fan? I mean, what's your disposition? Uh, my approach on this is going to be to advocate for a couple of things that need to get done in advance of the next election. I believe light item veto, for example, is a reform that I was really hoping was going to come in the Constitutional Convention. And what governor wouldn't want it? Every governor, what, 44 governors have it already. Right. There's only six who don't. We happen to be one of them. Unbelievable. That it's unbelievable. question three down, isn't it? Just uh, the, the, the lack of acumen on the part of the voters for what it was, combined with the advocacy and the scare tactics about what it would do, killed it. That, uh, you have to get the Constitutional Convention elected, and there wasn't a good enough campaign to, keep, to get it elected, in my opinion. Hmm. The, the, the con folks did a, a large mailer. They scared the pants off of everybody. And we have to know that that's what's going to happen, and you have to combat that. And it really wasn't done effectively. You went back into your, your business practice, and you've had a successful business. Yeah. Obviously, it, it must have taken a hit both from the investment you made in the race and your time spent away. No question. You regroup quickly? Uh, regroup really quickly. We have some very interesting projects on the, on the, on the uh, horizon, and uh, you'll be hearing about those in the next couple months, some national scale uh, stuff that we've looked into that, that will open up a lot of eyes. Government savings type of stuff? Uh, this one is actually deals with voter fraud, interestingly enough. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, when it's all said and done and you nurse the wound, disappointed you lost still. Of course. Does it wear off fast? Uh, for me, it took a good month to sort of get back to whatever normal used to be. 
Uh, it never really goes all the way away because you can second guess yourself to death. Mm. Uh, there's always things you wish you could have done differently, and you know, all the armchair quarterbacks uh, can talk about this and Took that. Took you a while to endorse Fung. I give yeah. you a little ribbing over that, but at the end, you did. Um, he couldn't put it over. The Healy factor was significant. By the way, the conspiracy theories that run amok that you and Healy came together, you want to give 10 seconds on that? Yeah. He uh, says he never talked to you. The, I never talked to him. It didn't happen. I put a bullet in the moderate party, and these guys resurrected it in a way that I'm not sure passed muster. The GOP didn't do a good job challenging it. Uh, you know, look, 22% for the outside candidate, the non-party candidate, what that tells you more than anything else is that the other two candidates' messages were lacking. That's what it says. And for everybody who wants to cast blame, you know, Ronald Reagan, is the president, says it's about taking responsibility for your own actions. If you lose an election, uh, it isn't anybody else's fault that you lost. You lost because you didn't get it done. Hmm. All right, but we need your brains, so stick around and come around. Right? I'm going to stick around. All right, Ken Block, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, one more thing when we come back to it. Thinking about Ken Block, you know, he and I have had some good arguments and some, you know, some battles, but the truth is, is that uh, he was a pretty smart guy in this campaign and maybe just didn't appeal and maybe the Republican Party wasn't the right fit but it's only a two-party system. If I were Gina Raimondo at all, I'd be bringing a guy like Ken Block in and picking his brain in terms of what he knows about systems, voter fraud, um, uh, you know, big-time social service fraud, all that kind of stuff because that's his expertise in his computer world. Uh, you know what, sometimes you got to draw from those who competed against you. And maybe that's a better resource than the folks who think you're the smartest in the world. Gina, think about that. We'll see you on the radio tomorrow at noon on WPRO and right back here at 7.30 tomorrow night.